My name is Ignacio Saez. I'm the executive director of the Center for Economic and Social Rights. We are an international NGO that has been working for many years on the links between tax justice and human rights. And I was saying that for that reason, it's a great pleasure to be taking part in this conference organized by the Tax Justice Network. TJN is an organization that we have been very proud to work with over the years to build stronger alliances between the tax justice and human rights communities. And until recently, I think it's fair to say that these communities had tended to follow parallel paths. Now, there's a much more commonly shared understanding that, uh, that tax abuse leads to human rights abuse, that rights require resources, and that human rights standards and human rights strategies and narratives can potentially guide us on the path to fairer tax policies. The challenge now is how to make those standards, strategies, and narratives much more effective in bringing about the kind of tax policy transformations that are needed to give effect to human rights for all. Now, in previous sessions, in, in the previous session uh, uh, today, we heard about an international initiative, the Principles for Human Rights in Fiscal Policy, which uh, two organizations represented on in, in this session, uh, CSR and De Justicia, uh, have been very active in, in steering. In the session that I'm chairing now, we're going, to, we're going to zoom in on three specific contexts which offer opportunities to bring human rights to bear in struggles for tax justice. These are contexts of post-conflict transition, processes of constitutional reform, and struggles against the scourge of illicit financial flows. Now, there's some conversation in the chat about whether I'm being heard or not. I just would like um, to, <laughs> for the organizers to give me a thumbs up that the sound is all fine. Thank you so much. So um, without further ado, let me introduce our three wonderful panelists today. Um, Alejandro Rodriguez Yach is the principal researcher at the Center for the Study of Law, Justice and Society in Colombia, an organization better known as De Justicia. We, uh, Alejandro will explore the fiscal dimensions of the transitional justice process in Colombia and the implications of ignoring these dimensions for human rights and for the peace process more generally in, in Colombia. Then we will hear from Asha Ramgobin, who is executive director of the Human Rights Development Initiative in South Africa. And she will be exploring the usefulness of the duty to pay tax enshrined in the African human rights system, the usefulness of this, this norm to combat corporate tax abuse and other illicit financial flows from the region. And our third speaker will be Mario Guzman Fredes, who is researcher and lawyer at uh, Capacidad Contributiva in Chile. And he will explore the aspirations or the, the potential to secure progressive and redistributive tax reforms in the context of Chile's uh, constitutional process. You can see their links and the papers that they'll be speaking to on the conference site. Um, I just wanna underscore that all three of our speakers today are pushing the boundaries of our understanding, pushing, pushing boundaries of the understanding of human rights law, exploring how to make better use of the provisions of human rights standards, uh, and also exploring our understandings, pushing the boundaries of understanding on issues such as transitional justice or the interrelation of, um, of international economic law or tax law with human rights law. So um, these are three pioneering and boundary pushing speakers. We're gonna hear uh, from each of them in turn, and then we will turn to some questions, including questions from the participants. You can raise these questions in the chat. I just wanna say I'm speaking in English, but we have um, translation, excuse me, we have interpretation from and into uh, Spanish. Um, and I particularly want to welcome any questions in Spanish um, on the chat uh, from uh, people who are listening to us from the region, from, from Latin America, um, given that uh, uh, two of our panelists today 
are, are based in the region. So uh, don't let language be a barrier to your participation. So without further ado, let me hand over to Alejandro to talk to us about uh, the fiscal dimensions of the transitional justice process in Colombia. Over to you, Alejandro. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for my presentation. Please let me know when you can see it. Uh, okay, so let me put it in, in presentation mode. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I am very pleased to present uh, the working paper with uh, Ovid Martinez that we have been doing about uh, about fiscal policy for transitions. Uh, so I think that the main messages that uh, I want to bring to these presentations are the following. First, uh, 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 the transitional justice uh, area expansion to including socioeconomic concerns might remain merely rhetorical if there is not a commitment with collecting enough fiscal resources through tax policy. And this is very important because a serious commitment to transitional justice socioeconomic concerns mean, mean to decisively, decisively allocate resources uh, towards redistributed policies, toward policies that can tackle uh, the main roots uh, or the root causes of conflict. Uh, and the third message is that if we're using the Colombian transition, transitional process, uh, we can show how transitional justice mechanisms that address socioeconomic issues, but that they don't link it, they don't have a link or that or they don't engage with tax policy could end up in defunding of these processes and initiatives and on a dispute over resources with other constitutional commitments and state commitments regarding human rights, uh, all resulting in a, minimal, in, in a minimalist piece that only focus on the classical transitional justice problems and do not address uh, the, 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 the problems related with uh, economic and social rights violations that uh, were the, the, the the root of the conflict in many cases in Colombia. So before going further, I would like to give a brief context about the Colombian conflict and the transitional justice process. Back in the 1960s, the far guerrilla group was born as an agrarian, an agrarian guerrilla in response to bipartisan violence, low access to land, uh, for peasant communities and very narrow political participation. After 50 years of more than 50 years of conflict in 2016, the Colombian government signed a peace agreement with FARC leaders. The agreement sought to end the armed conflict and move towards a stable and lasting peace. However, since other armed groups uh, in a very complex uh, conflict like other guerrillas and paramilitaries had joined confrontations, some of them remain and so the conflict persists. So after this brief context, uh, I, would, I would like to, to just give a definition of what is transitional justice. I would use the UN Security Council uh, definition is the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society a society's attempts to come to terms with a legacy of large scale past abuses in order to, to ensure accountability, serve justice and achieve reconciliation. So basically, transitional justice is about rights, about victim rights to justice, truth, reparations and non-recurrence. So the classical approach or the traditional approach of transitional justice focuses mainly in the judicial trials to hold accountable the perpetrators of human rights violations in the context of conflict, truth commissions to review what happened, and reparations that redress the harms inflicted to victims, accompanied by non-reparation measures, non-repetition measures, sorry. But there is a new approach in the transitional justice uh, camp. Or, or movement that, that is expanding the scope of, of transitional justice to better satisfy the victim's rights, particularly economic, social, and cultural rights. 
this new approach aims toward a maximalist peace uh, and transition in order to address the root the root causes on the, of the conflict. So if we if we don't address these these root causes in the transitional justice pro process there is a high probability that conflict persists because these the the, the 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 roots are still intact so this is the new approach uh but what we have seen is that transitional justice processes do not engage with fiscal policy particularly these processes that have this scope this scope of uh, addressing socioeconomic uh, aspects and this is problematic because this new scope is expensive. You need resources to finance a uh, state building capacity in, 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 in zones very hit by the conflict, to build roads, to build uh, hospitals, education, uh, everything around the, the, the socioeconomic aspects of the conflict. And uh, since there are not sufficient resources, because there is a no, uh, there is not a link with fiscal policy, transitional justice expansion may be underfunded. And this is this is where we take the Colombian case as an example. The peace agreement that I just spoke about included these transitional justice socioeconomic aspects in the peace agreement, uh, like the development plans with territorial approach that are based in public good provisions or uh, the land reform or building state capacity among other factors that point out to the root causes of conflict. But the problem is that it wasn't accompanied by an adequate fiscal policy. Why? We argued that the Colombian fiscal policy is in a dissonance. Why? In one hand, we have legal pressure for, ha for high public spending given by its con constitution. The constitution has some provisions that make that central government transfers to territories for right fulfillment have to be higher each year, the same as the social, uh, social spending. Allocations in social sp spending have to be progressive year to year. But on the other hand, we have a political and economic pressure to lower tax revenue. Uh, this happens for different reasons. First, we don't have a constitutional provision that ensures a minimum tax revenue. But on the other hand, the, the factors or aspects related to the political economy of tax policy makes that, makes that the tax system is ineffective to raise tax revenue because uh, the, the plurifier proliferation of tax benefits, low capital taxation, no wealth taxation or very low wealth taxation that makes the system regressive and that make that the tax revenue of Colombia is very low, is lower than the uh, Amer American Latin and the Caribbean average and way lower than the OCDE uh, country. So we have, there's where, where we have the dissonance. We have high pressure for, for spending and low revenues. So what we have seen is that elites in Colombia, political elites, never commit, never came to a commitment or a fiscal, a fiscal pact to back up the peace agreement. We didn't see a structural change in tax revenues or national transfers to subnational territories. And the result of this is budget cuts since 2017 to institutions in charge of key aspects aspects linked to the emergence and persist, uh, persistence of the conflict in rural areas, like land access, rural and economic development. We have some examples I'm showing here about two main agencies that since 2017 have been presented budget cuts, contrary to the trend that we, can, we need to see that is a progressive allocation of resources. And one of the main reasons is that they don't, the Colombian government all have their tax, their, their resources to do this. Finally, to wrap it up, some conclusions about the, the, the paper. Uh, while TJ has been moving towards socioeconomic aspects without the link with fiscal policy, these commitments might be only entail a rhetorical promise. Another conclusion is that progressive fiscal policy guided by human rights principle is crucial to back up this socioeconomic transformation because it can mobilize resources to satisfy victims economic and social rights, but also doing it while redis redistributing income and wealth uh, using the, the tax policy. And finally, the Colombian case shows without that without fiscal policy engagement, 
the result is a, minimal, a minimalist piece that only focuses on, uh, uh, on, on the classical approach of TJ of transitional justice, but it doesn't uh, address the, the socioeconomic aspects that gave uh, that, that gave reason to the conflict. So with having the risk of relapsing into the conflict again. So these are the, the conclusions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for um, exploring the links between, not just between tax justice and human rights, but tax justice, transitional justice, and human rights, uh, a really unexplored um, area of, of research and advocacy. Um, I'm going to move over to Asha. Asha, I'm kind of tempted since you're you're in South Africa, you're in the, the transitional context that so many other uh, countries <laughs> look to as an example. I'm, I'm tempted to ask you what resonates, but I'm going to I'm going to park that uh, that question for for our discussion afterwards. I know yeah. you, have, you have just eight minutes to present your wonderful paper on the duty to pay tax. So please uh, focus on that and then hopefully we can tease out some connections later. Thank you, Asha. Thanks so much, Ignacio. I certainly do have, I've made a few notes, but I'll leave that for later. Um, so my paper today is part of a larger research project for my LLD, where I asked the question as to how international law and some of its branches can be used to combat and reduce harm from ongoing uh, practices of tax havens. The particular branches that I look at are international human rights law and international economic law. The topic today on the duty to pay tax is one section of the broader study on human rights norms and standards to combat tax havens. So at this point, I would like to honor the founders of the African Charter and to, to celebrate the 40 year anniversary of its entry into force in 1981. But to also think about the fact that two years before that, in December 1979, in a context where there was a coup in Ghana, in Tanzania was sending troops to Uganda to oust Idi Amin. And in Southern Africa, we had a repressive apartheid regime that grew even more wicked after the Soweto uprising of 1976. In that context, Leopold Senghor, reminded the drafters of the charter that Africa is watching them, that Africa is counting on them to ensure the scrupulous respect of freedoms and rights. But he told the drafters very clearly that in Africa, rights cannot be separated from obligations. And then he instructed them to go against what had been done in other regions and to ensure that they included a suite of duties of individuals together with group rights, solidarity rights, all within a robust framework of individual rights. Uh, consequently, what we see is Article 27 to 29 of the Charter, all dealing with individual duties. And importantly for us today, Article 29.6 states that every individual has the duty to work to the best of their ability and to pay tax in the interests of society. Many human rights scholars were skeptical about including individual duties in the body of, of a binding human rights treaty. They worried that this might whittle down the more important aspect of in the inherent rights of people and the state obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill these rights. More than that, they wondered how on earth would these duties actually be enforced because a state can't haul an individual to a human rights mechanism. Uh, so for many years, the long list of duties contained in the charter did not receive much attention from the African Commission, its treaty monitoring body. But thankfully, as the commission became aware of the scourge of illicit financial flows, these duties and particularly the duty to pay tax started to get a little bit more attention, not enough by any stretch of our imagination, but at least a little bit more. So even though the charter is the only binding international human rights instrument that contains the duty to pay tax, we see very little clarification on what this means. For example, the wording says individual duty to pay tax, but does this include 
corporations or is it limited to natural persons? How is the concept of individual duty defined in international law and within the African human rights system? And more than that, does this duty to pay tax then give rise to state obligations? And if so, what obligations? What are the obligations of lawyers, accountants, and other regulatory bodies? And importantly, what are the obligations of state parties to each other? So in my paper, I look at the history of the charter and the jurisprudence of the African Commission to answer these questions. In summary, the Working Group on Extractive Industries, a special mechanism of the commission clarified that all these duties apply to both individuals and corporations. Further, that states have the obligation to ensure that the activities of corporations are subject to strong regulations. They are required to adopt legislative and administrative measures to ensure that tax is paid and that there are systems to collect these taxes and to ensure that the duties are understood. In my paper, I expand on the types of measures but for now, to borrow from the language of the Commission's resolutions, let me just say state parties are called upon to fight illicit financial flows, to review their tax laws and policies, and to improve their tax collection systems to ensure that corporations and individuals pay their fair share of taxes. States are required to report to the Commission on fiscal responsibilities, transparency obligations, and other measures taken to combat illicit financial flows. The Commission has also considered the threats posed by bilateral investment treaties, double tax agreements, and resource concession agreements, and requested state parties to review and renegotiate these agreements where applicable. Details of all of this are found in my paper. What obligations do states have to each other? To answer this question, I looked at the duty to pay tax together with other provisions that require uh, state parties to take individual and collective action to strengthen African unity and solidarity and to eliminate all forms of foreign economic exploitation. These are provisions in the African Charter, Article 21 of the Charter. The Commission expressed its concern that certain African countries operate as tax havens to the detriment of other African countries, but they could do much more on this issue. As a starting point, they could elaborate clearly on the normative content of the duty to pay tax in a general comment that could then be used as an authoritative uh, tool in the pursuit of tax justice. So if we are going to celebrate Africa, and address the racial dimensions of all these complex problems, then I propose that we embrace that which is truly an African contribution and that we sort ourselves out in Africa. In the context of tax justice, in a world of tax havens, it is indeed true that the United Kingdom is among the largest tax havens, but Mauritius, South Africa, Liberia, Ghana, and all African states have undertaken under a binding international treaty to work together with other African states to combat foreign economic exploitation. Each of these countries have also consciously ratified a treaty that includes the duty to pay tax that they specifically asked for. Can they now stand on a platform of tax sovereignty and adopt policies that affect another state's ability to collect tax and hence its fiscal sovereignty? My proposition is no. In Africa, they cannot and should not. And if they do, the African Commission has the mandate and the duty to hold them to account through its various mechanisms of engagement. The question is, will this happen? It is at this point that I become despondent. We have learned about the policy choices that were made by Rwanda to shelve their transfer pricing rules. We witnessed the consistent cry from Mauritius asking, why are you picking on me when the OECD countries are worse than us? Uh, we have a commission that at times operates more like a civil society organization than a treaty monitoring body. And we have an African union that has it, that's made up of heads of state that have vested interests in retaining the status quo. I asked myself, what would Leopold Senghor, Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere say to these men and women? 
So let me end here and repeat Senghor's words to all of us. The people of Africa are watching us. The people of Africa are counting on us, all of us, not only those in Africa, but all over the world, not to make excuses for our leaders, but to hold fast to the rule of law, constitutionalism, and the unique offering of Africa on the principle of solidarity, the notion of interdependence, and give substance to the duty of, to pay tax under the African Charter. I agree with Derege when he said yesterday that we should not focus on how to mainstream human rights in the tax justice campaign, but rather look at how strategies within the human rights framework at a domestic, regional, and international level can complement all the initiatives to achieve tax tax justice, and to build a more egalitarian society. Thank you. Back to you, Ignacio. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Asha, for that fascinating um, exploration of the, the duty to, to pay tax. And um, I loved how you put that in, in um, historical context uh, and really, really emphasizing its, its potential for advocacy um, on issues of mass scale tax abuse and illicit financial flows in the region. So we are going to go to um, Chile now, uh, a context which is not necessarily thought of as a transitional context, but I think is the, the really the context of, of, of societal transition that the whole world is uh, looking at and hoping for, hoping to draw inspiration from right now. It's not a transition, it's not a post-conflict transition, it's not even a transition from authoritarian rule. It's a transition really triggered by, by cit ordinary citizens being exasperated at, um, at a, a state of affairs, at an economy which simply doesn't deliver on basic principles of, of rights and dignity. So over to you, Mario Guzman, to um, talk to us about the the promises uh, and potential of the Chilean transitional process. Thank you so much. Greetings to everyone that is watching us. I would, I want to especially thank the organization TJN Global Alliance for Tax Justice, the City University of London, AABA, my colleagues of Capacidad Contributiva in Chile, and all those who make this instance possible, as well as Alejandro and Asha for their remarkable contributions. I've been summoned here in order to speak about the importance of tax justice and human rights in the constitutional process of Chile. On October the 18th, 2019, a wave of social discontent erupted into, national, into a national movement seeking structural changes in the Chilean constitution and legal system. Citizens demanded changes in economic, health, social security, educational, gender, and environmental matters. After several months of protest fueled by several cases of human rights violations, Chileans agreed to hold a plebiscite to decide on the drafting of a new constitution. Thus, an overwhelming majority of Chileans voted in support of a new constitution to be drafted in a constitutional convention without members of Congress. This convention is now the most representative body of the Chilean diversity and in a historic gesture, is led by an indigenous Mapuche leader, a woman. The institutional crisis and the global pandemic has further exposed glaring inequalities and revenue shortfalls to finance public health system and economic protection, highlighting the Chilean problems derived from the current neoliberal system instituted and embedded in the constitution. Thus today, Chile has some of the highest wealth concentrations of the OECD and above all other direct neighboring countries of the region, according to the World Bank. In addition, according to the World Inequality Database, during 2019, 27.8% of Chile's income was concentrated in the richest 1%. Moreover, while the richest 10% of the population holds 60% of the country's wealth, the bottom 50% of the population concentrates only the 10%. Moreover, according to the state of tax justice by the Tax Justice Network, Chile has an effective tax rate of 12%, which is less than half the average of the Latin region, 
8%, and even worse, is in the share of tax lost globally to corporate tax abuse responsible for index. Chile ranks top with 75%, while LATAM average is 1.4%. In other words, the Chilean tax policy has failed to deliver a redistributive and representative fiscal policies, and in no small part due con to constitutional provisions inherited from the Pinochet dictatorship. It is said by many that the Chilean new constitution is to be the culminating moment of the transition to a truly representative and inclusive democracy and so forth. It is our turn to talk about the fiscal perspective of this process. The current economic normative in the Chilean constitution is heavily influenced by neoliberalism and the thinking of Friedman and Hayek and neoproprietarism. Thus, the Chilean constitution presents various problems. First, tax matters are mentioned mostly in connection with fundamental rights of natural persons. Therefore, only establishes fundamental rights for, from the individual point of view. Consequently, the perspective of subjective rights overlaps the state's taxing power. Secondly, the constitution does not define or configure the ethos or nature of the taxing power of the state, something widespread in the constitutional framework of other countries, especially in the region. Neither the Magna Carta expressly establishes a duty to contribute, while the principle of equal sharing of public burdens is understood in a formal aspect, lacking a material and vertical approach. Therefore, there is equality in paper, but not in reality. Finally, when it comes to tax matters, the constitution gives exclusive competence to the president of the Republic, while in the rest of the world, this power is extended to other bodies. Constitutional tax rules have failed to achieve an egalitarian or equitable distribution of public burdens. And Chilean taxation is highly regressive and is based on taxes that mainly affect the poorest households while the rich remain paying lower, ta um, lower tax rates. This is mainly because, of, because the collection of direct taxes that could translate into material equality such as capital inheritance and income taxes remain comparatively low. There are no tax exemptions, for instance, for indirect taxes levied on goods on the basic family basket. However, there are several tax exemptions for companies and capital revenue. In result, the poorest Chilean households pay a higher proportion of tax on their income than the rich, creating inequalities in tax treatment between citizens, and unfortunately, and especially in women. The aforementioned results in the misconfiguration of the taxing power. So what is our proposal? Our proposal and principles for a new constitution are mainly focused on the need to refer expressly to the duty to contribute in order to legitimize the redistribution of wealth through fiscal policy, and also to make clear the responsibility not only of natural persons, but especially of companies in these burdens. Secondly, the principle of generality and uni universality in order to make a more democratic tax system that can be understood and respected by citizens. Thirdly, transparency, especially when it comes to the publicity of registry and initiatives such as the country by country reporting. Fourth, we have the taxable capacity and tax quality, which are often dodged by tax planning and exemptions that have no cost investment associated. But also, unfortunately, and just too often we see that the lack of proper enforcement makes possible to dodge the responsibilities, not only of corporations, but actually of managers and the establishment and lobbies that work for multinational corporations. Then we have progressivity, the gender perspective and inclusive taxation and tax legality. 
it would take longer to explain all of these principles one by one. But if I could sum up the general guidelines of this new constitutional process, there is a consensus that the crisis that affects the country and the region make it necessary to increase the collection of taxes without fear of the race to the bottom and without fear of the terror campaign against the social movement. It will also be necessary to reconfigure the tax system in order to finance social reforms that warranty the basic human rights standards of the population. We believe that the principles of solidarity, although not specifically a tax principle, but more of a general principle, could help us in this way. And although several problems of Chile, such as capital flight, the tax abuse by multinational corporations and mining companies, the vulnerability to illicit financial flows, and the integrated system of income tax are matters of law and not of the constitution, it is not less true that in our tradition, the constitution represents the ideals of the Chilean society. In this way, institutionalizing a more solidary vision, which allows to overcome the Chilean neoliberal system that the country is living within, could help us to improve laws, to perform a better enforcement, and to comply with better levels of transparency making it possible to create a fairer and more egalitarian society. And we believe that Chile has never had a better opportunity to achieve this than today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mario, um, for, particularly for ending on that, that hopeful note. Um, I'm struck by how many common threads there are between the three presentations. Um, Mario, you talked about the, the, the importance of uh, fostering awareness of the duty to contribute. Uh, as part of, of Chile's process, which links very directly to the work that Asha was speaking to around um, the duty to pay taxes in the African context. Um, several of you, Alejandro, Mario, talked about the relevance of, of constitutional mechanisms, constitutional provisions, how these can sometimes be used progressively to advance uh, rights-centered fiscal reforms, but also sometimes how they can they can prove to be a blockage. So I, before opening up to uh, questions from, from other participants here, um, I just want to ask you a, a, more, a more general kind of question around strategy. Um, Asha, you mentioned uh, Derage's uh, invocation to us uh, yesterday, I think it was, or, um, or maybe earlier this morning, to, uh, to think about how human rights strategies can complement the work that's happening around tax justice. There are many ways to give effect to human rights. You can you can give effect to human rights uh, in the street, you know, through street demonstrations, you can through social mobilization, through constitutional court challenges. One one of the crucial ways in which to give effect to human rights is by using the human rights mechanisms of accountability, the oversight mechanisms that exist. Those can be constitutional courts. Those can be regional human rights systems, as you were referring to, Asher. So my, my question to you all, um, Asher, I was struck, you, you mentioned in your paper something about the commission underperforming uh, uh, in, in its, in its um, yes. oversight role. So my question to you all is kind of what, what can we do or what needs to be done to make these mechanisms of enforcement of human rights or of oversight of human rights more responsive to issues of tax justice? Um, if, if there's another side to this, which is also what can we do to make the mechanisms of fiscal governance and oversight more responsive to issues of human rights? I think we're, we're working on both fronts. But since this is uh, since we're primarily coming from a, from a human rights perspective, I want to ask you all what can be done or what what what, what positive experiences are there in, in the context you've been working in of um, making the mechanisms of human rights me uh, oversight and enforcement more effective and more responsive to issues of tax justice. Who wants who, to- Who would you that? like to Asha, start? Asha, you look like you're ready to go. <laughs> I can, yeah, I, I, absolutely am. I absolutely am. I think, you know, this approach that I have uh, to, to human rights, it's a bit different from Upendra Bakshi, I think, I'm not sure if, if uh, people are familiar with him, but he's, um, 
a very uh, radical Marxist thinker, and he talks about a trade-related market-friendly human rights. So he talks about how uh, global corporations are in the process of supplanting the entire uh, UD, UDHR, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights paradigm in favor of what he calls a trade-related market-friendly human rights. So, you know, there is a danger of us getting caught in that kind of web, right? But I come from a background where the, the sort of protest that we would take on the street that you were talking about was always done in conjunction with lawyers ready to, 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 as they say, expand the space uh, for us as students in those days to protest, uh, you know, so, the, so for instance, get permission for a march or when we are uh, arrested to be there to, to you know, to, to bail us out or, or represent us. So at a domestic level, I'm gonna answer your question at a domestic, regional and international level. At a domestic level, what I see is that uh, there needs to be a stronger alliance between the tax justice activists, the technical tax justice um, uh, people and the human rights people. So, you know, to, to, to kind of work on strategies together. So that's the one thing at a domestic level. The other thing about how to make mechanisms more responsive, the court systems at a domestic, regional and international level, you know, what, whatever mechanism we're dealing with, whether it's the African Commission or whoever, each one of them are dependent on the lawyers to take cases to them. And that's how they actually evolve their jurisprudence and evolve their capacity. Sure, we can do training programs and all of that, but the important thing is to actually use the mechanisms in the way that they've been established. So uh, at, a, at a domestic level, when we're talking about courts, it's obviously uh, putting public interest litigation cases together. So when you're dealing with a socioeconomic right to health case, incorporate the fiscal dimensions as well. So when the government says, we don't have enough money to pay for that HIV medication, bring up the fact that you have regressive tax policies and, and you've, you've brought down corporate taxation and all of that. So bring those things up in pleadings. Um, there's also national human rights institutions at, at our domestic level that can, in, that can proactively undertake investigations into illicit financial flows and their impact on human rights, for example, in a country specific context. At the regional level, whether it's the Inter-American Commission, the African Commission, the European Commission or the European Court of Human Rights, again, it's a question of using those mechanisms in the way that they've been set up for. So, with, with the African Commission, the kinds of things we can do are shadow reports. We can, we can uh, present, um, present individual complaints to them. We can do a range of different things like this. We can also advocate for them to produce this general comment that I'm talking about or an advisory, advisory opinions on, on different things. So at, at, at a domestic, regional and international level, there are many, many things that we can do, but we can, they become more effective if we actually do them together rather than, you know, this fight between uh, the tax people and the, and the human rights people as to who should be in front. In a court, the human rights people should be in front, the lawyers should be in front in the court. But when we actually, in other kinds of, in other forums, it should be the activists that are in the front. So it depends on the forum. I don't think we should take hard and fast principle positions on this. We should be very strategic in how we, how we actually plan our campaigns. Wonderful, thank you, Asha. Um, I hope that we have moved beyond <laughs> competition towards collaboration rather than uh, deciding who should, who should be the protagonist. Alejandro, over to you, exactly. you're ready to, to answer. Yeah, I, I would just give a short answer regarding your question is, I think that one way to, to, to promote uh, a more responsive uh, human rights mechanisms towards uh, tax justice, I think that 
uh, normative development is a crucial issue. Uh, for example, uh, a normative development regarding the maximum available resource clause that many international human rights treaties contain. Uh, I think that it, this is crucial to understand what does it means really the mobilization of resources, where the establishing benchmarks uh, around the, 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 the revenue mobilization for guaranteeing minimum contents of economic and social rights. I think that those aspects are crucial. Uh, uh, another way I think that is a, a, a good way to, 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 to have a, a more responsive uh, make human rights mechanisms towards tax, ju tax justice, but also a more responsive, uh, 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 more responsive fiscal institutions to human rights is a dialogue between these two, these two, these two uh, uh, areas, uh, because uh, I think that there, there has to be more dialogue because both are pursuing the same objective, the same goal, but there is not the, the, there is not like an, a language that they can communicate and that is common for them. For this, I think that uh, the, the principles of human rights for fiscal policy that you were discussing in the last session is crucial to, to, to make this connection in order to make, to design fiscal policy guided by human rights principles. So both a objective or, or the objectives of these two areas can meet. Uh, uh, that is in the in, in, at the end uh, generating uh, welfare and human rights uh, fulfillment. Uh, so I think that those two things are are very important. Thanks, Alejandro. Uh, Mario, I would like to shortly answer. I believe that. When it comes to human rights and tax justice, there is a need to a broader and holistic approach. It is my humble opinion that in order to understand the current state of affairs, at least in, in Chile now, we're witnessing a paradigm shift, moving from a society based on principles of neo-proprietorship, individualism, privatization, economic freedom that has not translated into free competition, but rather into oligopolies. This has resulted in many abuses and unacceptable inequality for Chilean society, and it has weakened our democracy. Now we're looking forward in order to move towards a society that seeks more solidarity principles, that seeks redistribute of wealth, increase of tax collection, and in this way we could guarantee the financing of a social system that guarantees the fulfillment of human rights of the population. The truth is that because of the regressive nature of Chilean taxation, there are certain groups that are more affected than others, and it is especially serious when it comes to the situation of women, for instance. We have uh, the woman, women labor insertion that is below the 40%. So therefore, women that are the half of the population, but that are excluded from working or formally working in the Chilean system, also have to deal with a higher amount, proportionately speaking, than men. But also this is more accented in indigenous people, women, poor women, and the poorest households. So if we want to strengthen democracy, if we want to create a more transparent country, we need certain new approaches from the tax perspective that we really don't have now. So I think that is the challenge. There, there could be a lot of discussion on how we can approach this. There might be several ideas and this is gonna be a matter of a very interesting debate in, in Chile, but I think that's the, the path that we're walking now. Thank you for those responses. We have just uh, eight minutes left for this session and we have a hard stop at 29 minutes past. We have two questions um, from participants, which I'm gonna lump, uh, lump together or group together because they're, they're quite related. Uh, the first question is from Luke Holland, who from the Tax Justice Network and a, a former uh, dear colleague of ours at the Center for Economic and Social Rights. He asks, uh, beyond technical research and analysis, how can we build popular engagement with taxation 
as a fundamental so social justice and human rights issue? What sort of tools do we need and what spaces should we be targeting? And uh, the second question is from Alex Cobham, uh, the uh, CEO of Tax Justice Network. And he asks um, an interesting question on the role of the state. Human rights and tax justice both arguably reflect a fundamental optimism about the potential role of the state. How do we convince people for, who the, for whom the state has typically been an enemy, failing to count them or to be accountable to them, that this optimism is warranted and deserves their support. So um, I'm sorry to tell you, you have no more than two minutes each to answer this question. And I'm gonna, uh, bells will sound at the end of two minutes because we have to finish, okay? <laughs> I will, I can address, I'll, I can a second I can, question if that's okay. <laughs> sure, you don't need to address both. You don't need to address both. Just address, speak to whatever you want. Alejandro, you first, and then uh, Asha, then Mary. Okay, very quickly. Uh, uh, regarding the second question, I think that uh, that's a really tricky question, but uh, I think that, for, for example, in the Colombian case, uh, uh, yeah, there is no trust for, for the citizenship uh, regarding the state. Uh, this is because is the only the, the only thing that uh, communities see of from states are military groups or or includes uh, or other actions that don't do not relate with public uh, goods provision or human rights fulfillment. Uh, and this and this is very important for tax justice because there is no. There, this this is uh, this uh, lack of trust results in low tax, a very low tax morale, ta the, or, or lo very low tax. Uh, this uh, uh, a very sorry, uh, the, a, a very low uh, availability to pay taxes, or 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 they, they are not able to pay taxes because they don't trust the, the state. So I think that one thing, and, and this is also very linked to the perception of the injustice in the tax system. And this is very important as well. So I think that one of the ways to, to, to break this, the, 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 this, this deconnection or, and be more optimistic is to tackle the most in symbolic injustices in tax systems. For example, in Colombia, the tax benefits are, are seen as very unfair. Uh, uh, so if, if tax reforms tackle these issues and, uh, uh, and move towards symbolic uh, issues like this that change the perception of justice in the tax system, I think that this could be a first step for doing this. Fantastic. Thanks for keeping to time. Uh, Asha? So I, I would like to just deal with the, the issue of the nation state the changing nature, nature of the nation state in international law, particularly as it pertains to tax, tax uh, justice and tax havens. And I'm gonna be very brief about this and, and compare, compare this argument, you know, um, with, with the, with, with the anti-abortion people, you know, the, the pro-life people, um, they have a very strong pro-life approach on the one hand, and on the other hand, many pro-lifers are also pro-death penalty, cognitive dissonance. Similarly, many, uh, many proponents of small state, you know, like uh, limited, limited state power, st stand on the platform of state sovereignty to say that the state has, has the right to determine its own tax rates and has no obligation to uh, other states, uh, to you know, to, to consult other states or cooperate, or no sense of solidarity and all of that. So it's this again a sense of I, I believe cognitive dissonance in a sense because it's like it. I equate this that, that argument with the pro-lifers saying, you know, we also we also pro death penalty. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, similarly, a small state. Um, idea, the small state, big corporation, uh, on the, you know, the, the same person will propose small state, big corporation, and propose that the state has the sovereign uh, power to determine its tax rate and assert that sovereignty when it suits them. Basically, it's a question of how they assert these arguments. It's when it suits them. On an academic level, the question is, uh, you know, the, the question is more, uh, you know, more interesting, and we can talk about that. It's actually one of the sections of my my PhD as well. But um, 
on a on a strategic level, this is what I would like to just say. It's cognitive dissonance in a sense for me. Perfect. Be just very, within, just very within brief. Madeline. I'll be very brief. Yeah. Well, how to thanks to Luke and Alex for the questions. How to create a social engagement and how to convince people that the state is not the enemy in favor of tax justice. I believe that we have first a more direct approach that it, it has to do with advocacy and activism. But also, there is another approach. I think it needs to be with civil society initiatives aimed for education, funding of civic education programs in schools that include this matter as part of the educational of the educational programs of the countries. I believe also that we need to take the discussion out of scholars' circles and get it to people that can be more in touch with the fiscal justice and with taxes matters than it is today, which is what we do now in Capacidad Contributiva. But when it comes especially to how to convince people that the state is not the enemy, I believe it is not easy task. However, I think education is one tool and the other would be transparency standards and education for civil society and how to use the tools to request transparency from their organizations to keep their, go their governments accountable. Thank you so much, uh, Marion, to the three of you for also for the for the concision as well as the incisiveness of your remarks. Um, we have one minute left of the session, and in that time, I, I, I just want to say that I think this has been a very rich session in looking at the opportunities and challenges of advancing tax justice in, in contexts of political and social change. And I, I think it's it's been a very helpful discussion from the point of view of strategies for, for taking um, the convergence of tax justice and human rights forward. Um, and I think we've heard some really interesting ideas about how we can develop new approaches, more effective approaches uh, that are normative, you know, using and pushing the boundaries of human rights norms, uh, discursive, how we, can, how we can challenge some of the narratives that are um, blocking tax justice, uh, and how we can use human rights mechanisms and tools in, in, in mobilization as part of uh, broader mobilization processes. So thank you to my three panelists, uh, Alejandro Rodriguez from the Justicia, Asha Ramgogan from HRDI, uh, Mario Guzman from Capacidad Contributiva. Thank you all of you for participating. I'm sorry we couldn't take uh, more questions. Um, and please uh, stay for the next session, which is on the global Tax Justice Policy Horizon, uh, the FACTI panel, the UN and the OECD, we're next for global taxing rights, an issue that could not be more topical um, since there's so much movement on, on this uh, today and this week. So please uh, stay on for the next session and congratulations again to the Tax Justice Network for this uh, magnificent uh, conference. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>